Compassion Speaks, where we give a voice to the community. I'm your host, Stephanie Player, and today on our show, we have Carol Sletton, a board member for the Native Women Scholars, and Kamala Gaday, an Apache scholar. Thank you guys for coming and welcome. Thank you for Thank having you. us. <laughs> We're delighted to be here. I'm so excited to learn about this program and what it is that you guys do and how it can benefit people in our community. So let's just jump right into it. What is it that your organization does? Well, we're a, a very small a local organization, and we started about three years ago. It started out because I wrote a play called Three Strong Western Women, which was based on the lives of some women that lived in the area. And one of them was an Apache um, warrior named Lozen, and she rode with Geronimo. But the play got to be fairly successful, and we were able to donate some money to scholarship funds. And so the women and uh, some of the men that were supporting us in the productions decided to uh, form a nonprofit organization. So what uh, Native Women Scholars Incorporated is a totally a nonprofit organization, and we're just a very local organization. Our purpose is to help our Apache neighbors and um, the women. And right now we have three young women that we're helping. We have Kamala, and we have um, a young woman at NAU and one down in Tempe. So um, we've got three Apache women that are representing our area. And um, so it's, it's really wonderful because the Apaches, it's a matriarchal society. And so if we can help the women, then it benefits everybody. And if the Apaches do well, it benefits the towns that are surrounding the reservation too. Right. So, but it's been, it's been a great joy. Oh, wonderful. So uh, you say that you have three individuals that you're assisting right now. How many uh, total individuals have you guys helped since you've been around? The first year we had one. And then, um, so this, this is just our third year. And then last year we had a young woman, and we're helping her again this semester. And then we have been able to do two others. That's wonderful. Wonderful so. to be able to be a part of um, helping someone to achieve things in their lives that they're working towards. So yes, Kamla, being one of the recipients, how has this impacted you? It, it has helped me a lot. And I originally started off the summer working, but then towards the end of my contract, uh, some family issue came up and that's where I kind of had to help my family and you know I've what I was saving just kind of went into that and, um, and then I I found their uh, application applied for it and did the interview and then found out that I received the scholarship <laughs> so it helped me because I started off with a little bit of funds then I didn't have any then it, it helped me kickstart my semester, my my books, and uh, everything that I needed for school. But originally, it was just a transportation scholarship. Okay, to help to get you to and from. Yeah, because and for her, that's quite a, a problem because she lives in the beautiful community of Sibiki, which is gorgeous, but it's it's a big distance from where the classes are. Right, right. And that can be a challenge for individuals that are seeking um, furthering their education but are unable to just get to and from. And that's amazing, too, that it's not just helping to cover tuition or books or uh, other related expenses, but it's helping with even just the ground level of what is needed to get to and from. Mm -hmm. That's amazing that you were able to get that, that help. We have some um, really compassionate board members. Um, Marty and Ron Lamar, um, they're former administrators and teachers. And they realize that people need more than just tuition. They also want to stay in touch with our scholars and give them emotional and moral support when the red tape gets to be too much, which sometimes that's one of the hard parts, isn't it, for you, is, yeah. is red hate tape just uh, signing up for things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, we look at what their needs are um, as individuals rather than, uh, you know, the big organizations that do it. 
Right. Well, good for you guys. And what a, a interesting niche in our community to really be able to focus on and help. I can honestly say that you guys are very unique in that aspect of what it is that you do and your your uh, targeted audience of uh, individuals that you help, a population of individuals you help that otherwise would may not be able to receive that type of assistance. Um, so. <laughs> What do you think, I'll, I'll throw this question your way, Kamala, what do you think are the main challenges that Native women face when they want to get an education? I feel that it's, first of all, it's uh, financial issues of paying for school. Uh, I, a lot of students, including myself, have been told that your education's free because you're a Native American, but that is... Definitely not true. <laughs> I found that out when I was applying for schools and all the fees that came with just applying for a school. Um, it, it took me by surprise because there's enrollment fees, registration fees, and residence fees that you have to pay before you actually get in. And uh, that was very surprising for me. And I can imagine that people go through that as well when they apply for schools. You know, they are mainly focused on the tuition fee, but there are a lot of fees that come before paying for right, a school. Right, Just hidden applying. fees, right. And then ongoing fees of yeah. getting the books that you need, which yeah, anybody books are who expensive. has any exactly, <laughs> anyone who has any experience in the current costs of getting that higher education knows mm -hmm. how expensive it can be to get those materials needed depending on what classes you're taking and uh, it can be quite a challenge to meet that and and I guess that's right where you guys come in is to help to cover some of these hidden costs and, and things that are um, ultimately causing people to not pursue that because they're being, they're unable to, to uh, accommodate those costs that pop up. Yeah, and if, if they're attending a, a college or university that's local, um, some reservations are farther from the actual institution, and like in my case. So it is about an hour to get to where I live, to my class, and you have to pay for gas costs and you know, anything that might come along with your uh, vehicle. And so it's, it's just getting to and from class, in which may not seem like a problem, can actually become an issue because it is expensive. Right. Well, and, and good for you for sticking with it and looking for options and trying to do whatever you could to, to, to explore what it is that you wanted to accomplish. And thank goodness for your program and what it is that you guys do to be able to provide an opportunity for individuals like Kamala and, and others that may be in similar situations, wanting to do something and, and feeling like they, they may not have an option. So that leads me to, okay, Okay, we, we can see what a great job you guys are doing and what an important service it is, but I know you guys need support to we do. keep this going. Yeah. How can our viewers that are now very interested in wanting to support you guys, how can they get involved? How can they support you? Well, one of the uh, fundraisers we have going on right now is we're selling this beautiful uh, original painting by Jesse Hummingbird, um, and you can purchase tickets for that, it's a, a raffle at the Pine Top Lakeside Chamber of Commerce and the Sholo Chamber of Commerce, or you could mail us a check, and it's all tax deductible, and all the money that we get, because we don't have any employees or anything, and the, the, when we have raffles and things, we donate it. For instance, I designed a quilt a few years ago and things like that. So the board members um, contribute what what we're going to um, raffle. And so all the money goes to the scholarship. So it's a really good fundraiser um, like because exactly. it goes directly to the girls. Right. The, um, get your checkbooks out and send <laughs> us a little check at P.O. Box 2981, Pine Top, Arizona, 
85935. And we'll have that information too at the end of the segment Great. as well. So that way people can get that pen and paper ready to write it down. Good. Thank you. What an awesome organization. And to know that any way that you support it goes directly to the recipients of, of these, pro, the, these scholarships. And the girls that we have, um, one of the criteria that we always look at is if they're going to give back to their own community. And the girls that we have are, um, Camelia, you're in, in uh, computer science, yeah. right? And one of our girls is in elementary education. The other one is in public health. So all of these things are very important. Service-oriented, yes. And we feel like some of the computer jobs now can be done locally. My husband, for instance, works from our cabin in Pine Top, and he works with people from all over the world. Right. And he'll be teaching a class at... Um, in White River next spring, too, in uh, uh, computer class, so that some people can get some education and then stay in their own culture, which is real important. Awesome. Well, and, and I want to know, too, as we're starting to wrap up here, are there any other fundraisers that you guys have coming up outside of this raffle? Um, uh, anything else that you guys are able to mention that people could help to well, support you with? Yes, we've, we've got um, a fundraiser. We're going to have it at Pico's Nursery next spring. And um, the date hasn't been finalized, but it's kind of at the end of June on a Friday evening. And uh, it'll be... Um, Entertainment will be celebrating Apache culture. Wonderful. So we've done oh. a play uh, three or four times. We'll probably do a play down in the valley again. The play that I wrote um, has been um, a fundraiser for us and will continue to be. But this sh this will just be a really neat party, and we'll have some Apache crown dancers and some food and. It should be great. So we'll get, be getting that information out in the spring. Oh, how amazing. Oh, sign me up. I will be there. Good. Uh, <laughs> such an amazing experience. And Picos and is a beautiful location. Exactly. It is. Oh, I, what a better place to be able to host something yeah. like that. And they're well, board members. Thank you, guys, so much for joining us today. Kamala, good luck to you. I wish you the best, and I'm so glad that things are moving in a positive direction for you. Yeah, thank you. And Carol, thank you so much for joining us, both of you, for talking about the Native Women Scholar Program and how it is that people can get involved and help. And I hope that we get some more support from you out of this segment. Thank you so much. Thank you for hosting us. Thank you. And stay tuned. We'll be right back with the Lions Club. Welcome back to Compassion Speaks. Joining us now are Dr. Jeannie Evans with North Country Healthcare and Nancy Dowling, the Lions Kids Site USA Administrator. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you guys so much for being here. Y'all are here to talk about a very important topic. So I want to just kind of jump into it and hand it over to you, Dr. Evans, to talk about what it is that you guys came here to discuss. We're talking about vision in particularly. Um, when we start out life, we utilize our senses to figure out who we are, where we are, and what we are in society or in general and above. When we are born, all, the only sense that we have is hearing that's complete. Our nervous system isn't complete. Our vision's not complete. So all we hear is noise until we have that ability to interact. Um, what we look at with vision in particular is that as we develop it, is that it's essential for other development areas. Motor skills. Anybody who's had a toddler, they pinch or grasp. If they can't see what they're go that Cheerio or whatever they're going after, they're not gonna learn that fine motor skill. Right, So that will, sense. That will have some issues with it. Um, helps them learn to walk with balance. What we don't realize as adults that we use our eyes as our primarily, primary upright status to tell us where we are in space, to make sure we don't fall over. Right. Um, the ears have an aspect with it as well, but kids need that to learn how to walk correctly because they're looking at their horizon to make sure it's level. Right. So it, it, 
you don't really think about how, um, how much it plays in with the other things that are developing in childhood and how if one of those things is off, so if, if the vision isn't where it needs to be, um, it can ultimately impact all these other, the fine motor skills like what you mentioned, and even being able to gain balance and learn that process of walking and standing up on their own two feet even. Interesting. Very much so. Um, and we have to look at, for vision screenings, why they're important. Like I said, neurologically, we're not completely developed when we're born. Our brain has to have the stimulus of the vision center from the eyes and the vision center to develop. If it doesn't have it, we don't develop it. And that plays a lot of response. And if we lose vision in one eye or there's a big difference in vision from one eye to the other, the brain will shut off that eye. Oh, wow. And if we don't catch it early, it becomes irreversible oh my goodness. later in life. Mm -hmm. So these are things as, as uh, parents of small children at, that you don't necessarily think of. You know, you're definitely bringing your child in for the well checks, and of course, whenever they need immunizations, whenever they're sick, but knowing the importance of these visual screenings early on, I think is, is from what you're saying, very key to making sure that the development stays on track. Definitely so. Um, when I see a patient or a child for a well check, I see a snapshot in their life. I don't see the whole motion picture. Parents see that. I have to rely on what parents are saying to me. They may, they may cross their eyes when they're tired, and I never see it because they're right, right awake and very angry <laughs> that I just looked in their ears <laughs> at, at them. So they're focusing you know, at me, fine, I don't see it. Right. Have it checked. So it takes that communication from parents to really keep an eye on that and, and be able to communicate that to your doctor, your pediatricians and your family doctors to make sure that um, those things can be caught soon on and addressed yes. very quickly. The sooner we catch it, the more, less likely the brain will shut off an eye and lose that vision all completely. Um, and vision is more important than that. As we get into school age, it's important for language acquisition. We um, sight and sound to go together. We use it for spatial, where things are in space, which is your math, your science, your social studies. We use all of that all the time. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that good base and you're in a regular classroom, you're going to end up having a child that's not going to perform as well. And they can develop poor self-esteem, school, school avoidance, things right. along that nature. And so there's this kind of um, um, almost just avalanche effect of this, of how it can just compound into other issues and um, develop into a problem that can be so much more difficult to um, assess and fix and, and reverse anything and could possibly be irreversible in, in many ways too. Correct. So very important topic that we're talking about here and bringing mm -hmm. awareness to this to parents out there and just the community as a whole. Um, so I, at this point, I kind of want to segue into what it is that the, the Lions Club does. Uh, this is the Ponderosa Lions it, Club. We are. <laughs> so <laughs> tell me, Nancy, what, what is it that the Lions Club does? Well, it's actually international. It's through the Lions Club International that has um, gotten this program, Lions Kids Site USA, off the ground, where Lions Clubs throughout the uh, country are using this um, tool right here, this vision screener. This is a spot screener. Um, it's essentially a portable automated refractor that allows us to screen the children from six months of age all the way up to adult. And the beauty with this is that we can screen children even with special needs because we don't have to have a verbal response from the child. Wow. So it's a beautiful thing. It takes only a couple of seconds to do, requires us in a, a dark room so that their pupils will be large enough, uh, four millimeters or larger, uh, so that we get an accurate reading with this um, spot screener. Um, the fun thing with this is it makes chirping sounds, um, birds chirping, and there's lights that flash inside. So the children are totally intrigued from the moment they see it. They think it's pretty neat. Um, and so it's their, their intent, and they are totally cooperative, and it takes two to three seconds, and then they're actually disappointed because the lights get turned off. And then it's over. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But the importance with the screening at a young age is that children don't know to, to relay to their parents 
um, that they're having a visual problem. Oftentimes, if they have a, a visual uh, issue, they don't, they think that that's normal. They see blurry to them. That's how it has been from the beginning. They think that that is how it is. The brain tries to compensate, um, but they don't know to relay that I can't define the leaves on a tree. I don't know that there's blades of grass. It's all green. Right. And I think that's normal. Right. The vision screener allows us aside from checking visual acuity, checking to see, can they see 20, 20, 20, 30, um, only goes so far. Children have an amazing ability to compensate with their eyesight. So they may have poor eyesight, but they may still pass the visual part of it, reading the eye chart, um, because they can compensate for that split second to be able to identify what that is on the chart, tell you what it is, leading you to believe that their vision is okay when in fact it's not. And that's what the importance of the spot screener is. And Lions Club um, International is all about eyesight. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we catch these children early um, because if they do have a vision problem, then we can get it corrected before they start school. Um, children learn visually, 80% of their learning is, is visual. And if, any of, if that is impaired in any way, that will hinder their education. And um, there's an eye condition called uh, strabismus or lazy eye um, that if it's not caught by the age of seven or eight years of age, that, that lazy eye is permanent meaning that the eye wanders out. It doesn't focus like the, the good eye. And um, when they're young, the eye doctor can force that, that good eye, the poor eye, the lazy eye to work and block the good eye, um, making those muscles stronger to try and correct that, which is correctable, but at a young age. Right. And um, those things, like um, she said, are not detectable unless they come in tired to the office or unless the parents notice something and uh, which is usually it. yeah prominent when they're when they're tired right well and i'm just amazed too that this this the wonders of technology right <laughs> yeah. uh, that it's able to um, work with infants you know we're talking mm -hmm. 6 month old children being able to identify it that early on whereas before it, you had to wait till the child could ultimately communicate with you. And then even still, as you're saying, it becomes normal to them. So they don't necessarily know to communicate that they're having a visual issue. Right. So uh, what a what an awesome way to be able to do this. So that leads me to my next question is, yes. how much does it cost to have this type of screening done? Um, actually, it's free. And that's why we're here. We want to get the word out and let the schools and the daycare centers and the Head Starts know that we are doing this program is, is offered free. Oh, that's awesome. Um, the, each wow. um, child gets a printout of the vision screening, and it'll let us know whether they've passed the eye exam or whether they, it's recommended that they be referred to an eye doctor. Uh, those children who have referrals for an eye exam, we follow up with, with them within um, two to four weeks to make sure that they were able to be seen by an eye doctor and did they get what they needed. Um, we also offer uh, financial assistance for families uh, that qualify if, they, if their insurance will not cover uh, the Lions Clubs in their area. We'll work with them to help them uh, cover the eye exam and the glasses. Wow. How comprehensive of a service. That's amazing. It's, and it's vital. We've got to get that word out there because I'm sure that, that this applies to so many families out there that otherwise would not have access to these types of services. And for it to be free, that's absolutely amazing. How do you make it free? Do you guys, are you getting support from the community? Can people help out to support you guys? Oh, well, we always welcome volunteers. <laughs> um, we have a group of um, Ponderosa Lions who in our, in our particular group have been trained um, with, on the spot screener so that they know how to do it properly. Uh, but we're all volunteers. We do this because we have a passion for children and we want them to be able to have the best education possible. And being that eyesight is one of those huge factors, we want to oversee that and make sure that their needs are met um, so that then when they do start school, they don't have that hindering them from having a good education. And, and to be able to reach those special needs children, that's a big deal yeah. um, because, you know, uh, th without this tool, that would be, it's very difficult to screen a special needs child because most of them cannot verbally give back any feedback as to what they can see or even any complaints they might have with their eyesight. 
Right. Well, and we'll share your contact information as well at the end of the segment. So that way, anybody who wants to get involved or look further into even seeking this service for themselves and their own families can get a hold of you. Is there anything that you want to say as we're wrapping up here and about to close out to, to the viewers? Um, I just like to add that in the, the uh, five months that we have started this program, just with Ponderosa Lines, just with our uh, organization in Overgard, um, we have screened almost 750 children. Wow. And on average, when we go do a screening at a school or a daycare or Head Start, 20% uh, come turn up needing a referral for an eye exam. So this is very effective in finding those children who have those needs and picking them early so that we can get whatever needs correcting taken care of. It's a preventative effort and it is. helping to, to prevent things from getting to a point where it's more difficult to assist. Right. Thank you guys so much for coming and joining us today and talking about this important issue. I really hope that this helps to get the word out and get more people connected with this service, more volunteers for you as yes. well to help make this <laughs> and continue for it to be possible. So thank you again, Dr. Evans, Nancy. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you, you so here. much. Thanks for having us. And thank you for joining us today. Be sure to tune in next month to hear Compassion Speak. <laughs>